Hello, my name is Jacob Todson, and welcome back to the Wisdom of Odin. Today, I'm at Wayland Smithy here in southern England to discuss the being that gave this site its name. Now, keep in mind, this site itself comes from the Neolithic period and was built by people who most likely never talked about Wayland. But when the Anglo-Saxons settled here in around 500 or 600 CE, they found this site to resemble a blacksmithing forge, and the folklore and mythology around Wayland was attached to this. Now, the name Wayland itself comes from the Proto-Germanic Wieland, and then eventually up into Old Norse with Voland. And we get a lot of information from a lot of different sources, because there's a, a scattering of information about Wayland as he survives today, which is one of the things that I find most interesting about this subject, is that we don't know that much information about a lot of deities that existed in Northern and Germanic mythologies. But yet we know so much about Wayland, who was not even a god. So how did someone like this survive through history and time? Well, hopefully through this video you'll understand why, because his story is quite interesting. There are a couple of artifacts to talk about here, one being the first one where we see Wayland's name pop up, which comes on a coin. Now, there is some debate whether or not this is Wayland the Smith or Wayland A. Smith, someone taking this title as their imprinting name when making coins back in the past. An interesting debate I don't really know the answer to. However, it makes sense to me that we have someone that looks like a blacksmith on a coin. It says Wayland. So to me, this kind of just comes together. We also have the Frank casket, which I recently saw in the British Museum, which is a very beautiful box that was found in the Frank's territory in modern day France. And on this, we see a depiction of a figure that looks like Wayland. And I believe on the runes as well on the box, we see the term Wayland pop up. So this beautiful casket box found in the Franks territory, the various names of Wayland, and then the Anglo-Saxons putting the name Wayland to this place here, and the mythology that goes around it. So really interesting. I mean, it, it's honestly crazy how, how much this name survived. Now where of course it gets more interesting is where this survives as the story comes from the poetic Edda and the Leia of Voland where we get the complete story of Wayland and why he was so significant. So this is really good and really exciting that we do have this information. All right, we're gonna go a little mobile so you can see this tomb for yourself. This is a crazy presence to it. I mean, obviously you have the exterior here already impressive with these four massive stones looming over you. But then the actual tomb itself, I mean, it goes back to pretty decent. You can get in there. So uh, let me take you in there with me. This tomb, I mean, has a presence to it. So, I mean, yeah, I came right here and, you know, I put my hand up and then immediately you just feel something so different. And when you come in here, I mean, yeah, you got these two little chambers to the left and the right. And I mean, you can't go back any further, but I know there was a central chamber further back in there um, that obviously is sealed now that's been excavated and whatnot. Um, but yeah, really crazy in here. I mean, one of the main purposes of this channel is to not only to share with you the information, what we know from history, but also to come to these places and, and feel them for myself and, and share with you um, how they feel. And honestly, I'm very overwhelmed here. It has a very heavy energy. Like, uh, like I, I feel out of breath, even though it's like, I don't know, I feel it. Like, yeah, it's, it's breathtaking, I guess is the best way to describe it. And uh, even just the trees out here, like the, the big dead trees outside add to the ambiance. You never think it with the giant field I had to come through to get into here. Um, wow. I haven't seen any evidence of people leaving offerings. Um, one of the things that is uh, attached to this spot is the leaving of coins because there's a famous story where someone left coins out and then the spirit of Wayland repaired his horseshoes, I think it was. And so ever since that folk tale, people have been leaving coins here. But I guess uh, it got so bad uh, that the British government started taking the coins and donating them to charity, which I think is really funny. Um, so I expected to actually see some here, uh, but it doesn't appear that anyone's left any. So I'm going to leave some uh, right now just because, I mean, I, I feel very, yeah, it's just, it's a heavy, heavy presence here. And I, I just want to make sure it knows that I'm here as, you know, someone doing research, um, but also someone uh, with great respect uh, to the ancient powers, the gods, uh, to who was buried here. And so I want to continue that folk tradition of uh, giving some coins. Yeah, so I think I'm going to uh, get out of here because, um, yeah, this is, this is wild.
What I want to do with the majority of this video is actually just read you a rendition of the story of Wayland. Now, keep in mind, I did kind of create this in my own language. Uh, however, it's heavily based on Jackson Crawford's translation in the Poetic Edda of the Lay of Voland. So I cut out a lot of the dialogue here just because there is a lot. I highly recommend you check out uh, the full story for yourself. However, I, I just wanted to give you a, uh, an idea of the story of Wayland and the main points to take away from it. So um, yeah, I'm going to read you the story of Wayland and then show you some beautiful scenes of Wayland Smithy here as I do it. And I'll see you on the other side. The King of the Finns had three sons, Voland, Egil, and Slagfin. The three brothers lived on a lake called Ufsia. One morning, the three brothers waked to find three beautiful women spinning thread on the lake shore. Near them lay the skins of swans, and it was then that the brothers realized that they were the Valkyries serving the High One himself. Their names were Halothguth, the Swan White, Ervor, the Wise, and Oldrun, Princess of the Franks. The men took these women as their wives, and for seven winters they lived in happiness off the shores of Lake Ufsia. The women were eventually called to serve the One-Eyed once more, and were required to travel to distant battlefields to serve his will. Aegil and Slagfin grabbed their skis and went to search for their wives. Voland, however, chose to stay behind, as his skills as a smith were widely known, and he had much work to keep him busy. He worked on gold and colorful jewels, he assembled rings and struck them on ropes. In his own way, he hoped his wife Olrun would return one day as she had left him a trinket in the form of a ring that he cherished more than anything else. It was during this time that the King Nithyuth of Niari learned the legendary Voland was alone in his valley without his mystical bride and his brothers. The king sent his men in the night of a waning moon to capture Voland. Upon crashing open his door, they did not find Voland, but they did find his insanity, for he had forged 700 identical rings to the one that Oldrun had left him all strung like decorations in his home. These soldiers took one of these rings and left to lie in wait for Volan to return. During the night, Volan was in the forest hunting for his dinner. As he was a master archer, no prey was safe from him, not even the bear as it was taken down in just one shot. When he returned home, Volan tended the fire and roasted his meat. The fire then whispered something to him, telling him something had gone wrong in his absence. He then sat on the skinned bear's hide and counted his 700 rings, only to come one short. He wept as he thought that it must have been old rune that had returned to claim her ring back. In hopes of seeing her, he stayed awake in front of the fire, but soon he gave to his needs for sleep, and when he awoke again he was bound in chains. He awoke to the face of King Nithyuth, smiling down at him, Volan's sword on his hip. The king then called to his daughter Bothilder, who he then presented a gift of Volan's ring to the same one that Oldrun had given him. Volan then howled with a primal rage, howling at the distant moon in a prayer for revenge as he saw his prized possessions in the hands of others. The king, seeing he would seek revenge, ordered his men to cut Volan's handstrings and imprison him on the island of Svastoth. It was there that he was forced to work as a blacksmith for the king, creating many treasures and present on the island. The king was the only one brave enough to visit the island and collect what Volan had made, for his rage could be felt in the wind around the island. Volan never ceased in his work, never slept, and he never stopped plotting his revenge. Then one day he found the key to his own salvation. The king's two young sons came to visit with their detachment of guards. In the chamber of the forge lie a treasure chest of immense size, where Volan stored all of his craft. The boys could peer inside the keyhole to see the glowing treasure within. They asked Volan for the key, and he told them to come back the next day alone. He would show them all of the treasure inside. They agreed, and when they came back the next day, they both once again peered inside the keyhole. And as they did this, Volan swung a sword, chopping off both of their heads. He then hid their bodies under the bellows, skinned the flesh from their skulls, and plated them in pristine silver, gritting cups for the king. He also forged jewels from their eyes and a brooch from their teeth for the wife and daughter of the king. It is then that Bothilder, the daughter of the king, came to mend the ring that was stolen from Voland. He then made her drink and seduced her that night, and in the morning he broke free from his chains and flies to the castle wall, where he visited the king crying in his chamber. And as the king saw Voland come over the wall, he turned to him and asked, 
Tell me, Voland, you crafty elf, what kind of fate did my sons meet? Voland then tells the king of his revenge in vivid detail about the death of his sons and the way that he seduced his daughter, getting her pregnant in the process. Voland then flies from the walls of the castle. No archer or rider the king can catch Voland as he escaped into the horizon of a new dawn. The king then comforts its daughter, who confirms that she is pregnant, and they both lament ever dealing with Voland, the smith of the northern world. So after reading that story to you, hopefully you can see a couple of the elements here that are really interesting to this. So the main question is, is he an elf, as he's referred to in the Old Norse story? That I'm not so sure about. It does appear that he has magical powers uh, of flight, possibly, because it does describe him flying uh, and possible shape-shifting as well. And especially when he gets angry, it seems like his rage has a, a power and a presence to it. So I don't think Wayland was just a man. He may have been an elf, but possibly he is a being, a god. That is up to you to decide. However, the Anglo-Saxon psalm is important naming the site after him, and obviously the folk customs that came with that have survived to today. And I don't know if I have the answer to you of whether or not you can go and worship Wayland, uh, but I can definitely tell you that there is a, a power and a presence to this deity, and perhaps it might be a smart idea to leave offerings of coins when you are working with craft or blacksmithing, and definitely if you come across a smith, you should probably not cut his Achilles tendon, steal his wealth, and then imprison him on the island, because he will take vengeance. So if that is the lesson you take from this video, it's a good lesson to have. Thank you so much for joining me for this video. I hope you found it entertaining and enlightening, and please make sure you like and subscribe and all that good YouTuber stuff, as I am currently exploring Northern Europe and exploring sites such as this and sharing it with you here at the Wisdom 